Welcome and thank you for watching this pre-recorded training session. This session is intended to supplement the real-time analytics webinar that was broadcast on March the 21st, 2019. Um, in that webinar, we looked at the benefits of configuring a cluster slave to replicate your data out of an existing tungsten cluster into your analytics environment. I presented a demonstration joined that session but did not go into detail on the installation steps and configuration. This webinar is intended to be used as a training session to provide that level of detail. So the, uh, the, the demonstration that I gave um, was for replicating out of a cluster. In, in the case of uh, my demo, it was a three node cluster that I called NYC where I had DB1, DB2 and DB3. I then had my uh, replicator installed on CS01 as my cluster slave, and that was replicating out to a host running Kafka and a separate instance of Redshift um, up in AWS. Now, the things that uh, you see on the screen here, um, obviously, I didn't go into detail in the webinar about Zookeeper and S3. So let me just quickly um, kind of cover the, the relevance uh, of that in this particular scenario. So when we uh, replicate out to Kafka, we replicate messages uh, onto a Kafka message queue that your consumer or whatever you have on the other end will, will pick up and interpret. And those messages are in the form of JSON, um, and, and they're fairly self-explanatory. What we also do is we rely on Zookeeper, um, which is part of a Kafka install. Zookeeper allows us to uh, keep a track of, uh, of where we are with replication. So in a normal database environment, we have our tungsten tracking schema with our T-Rep commit seek no tables, etc. The, the use of Zookeeper in this instance is, um, is a similar thing. It, it's there for us to track um, that TREP commit seek no data. In terms of Redshift and the reason we use S3, uh, the applier for the replicator to Redshift works in what we call batch mode. And that means that when we receive the THL from the cluster, we convert the transactions um, into CSV files. Um, so what we do is we convert uh, into a, a simple CSV file and we attach a little bit of information to it, whether the, uh, the row is an insert or whether it's a delete. Um, and the timestamps and a bit more row information. In the case of updates, that gets converted into a delete followed by an insert. We load that, as I say, into CSV. Those CSV files get dropped onto S3. S3 um, is then um, linked, and we have the, the JavaScript process uh, for the batch applier running, which takes them from S3, loads them into staging tables on Redshift. Those staging tables would then be showing change data, so it would show all the inserts and the deletes and the combination of insert deletes that represent an update. And then the final process would be to merge all of that information up into base tables to give you the view of the data as it was on the source. So um, we, we basically collapse the information down and always give you a, a final view. And that's all done through the uh, apply process from CSV and then the JavaScript processes, which do the, the merging and the, and the moving of the data for you. Now, obviously, um, you're familiar uh, with setting up cluster hosts and how you need to deal with prerequisites. Obviously, there are still a number of prerequisites um, that apply to your um, to your cluster slave host. Um, I would always recommend just reviewing the documents. Um, there's obviously a lot of detail there. I'm not going to go into great detail here. Um, we don't, you know, so I want to keep this short. Uh, but look at things like the OS user, make sure that's set up. The etc. host file is set up. Ruby, Java installed, network um, for the network, you need to ensure that you have the relevant ports open to read THL from the source cluster. By default, uh, we would be on 2112 for the THL, but you may have configured that differently. Um, you then need to ensure that the relevant ports out to Kafka and out to Redshift are open so that you can uh, communicate out. In terms of the database, uh, you need to ensure user accounts are set up on Redshift and that you have a database created that you want to replicate into. Uh, we will create the schemas as part of the, the process, but we need the database there. 
um, in your source cluster, um, there are a couple of things that you will need to do. Uh, we will need to ensure that your source cluster is running in row-based logging. Um, so if that's not uh, that's not done, you will need to do that. And we will also need to have an additional parameter added into your configuration of your cluster. So what I'll do is I'll just switch screens now to my terminal session, and I will uh, first of all explain those two things to you. Okay, so if you watch the webinar, you'll be familiar here with the screens. It's uh, exactly the same. Um, so what I'm going to do is just focus here on DB1 in the cluster. Um, all three of my nodes are exactly the same. DB1 is my master. CCTRL, um, and I'm just doing LS. This is an output that you're obviously familiar with. So we can see the master and my slaves. So I mentioned we have a couple of parameters. So first of all, um, you need to ensure that your database bin log format is row. OK, um, if you need to change that, um, you'll obviously need to do rolling maintenance to apply that across your entire cluster. In addition, within your tungsten configuration, whether you use staging or INI, you need to enable heterogeneous service and we need to have that line. Uh, this is to allow us to have a little bit more metadata detail in the THL. It will allow us to process that THL for non-MySQL targets. So if your cluster slave is writing out to another MySQL instance, whether that's a standalone instance, whether that's um, RDS MySQL, RDS Aurora, or Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud, you don't need this line. You only need this line if your target is anything other than MySQL. So in my example, I'm doing Kafka and Redshift, therefore I need it. And that needs to go on all hosts within the cluster. Okay, so once that's ready, uh, we can go on to our cluster slave host. So the usual prerequisites I've discussed, um, in addition for Redshift, we do need to be able to reach out to S3. So you need to install the S3 command tools. Now, I've already got this installation uh, running. Obviously, you saw the, the webinar, so it, it's already in place. So I'm not actually going to do the install, but I will step you through this, the, the process. So first of all, uh, assuming all your prerequisite, prerequisites are in place, you need to uh, put the, the, the package for the replicator into opt continuous software, expand that tar package, and that will give you a file uh, a directory like so, labeled with whatever version we are installing. Um, within here, uh, we need to go to uh, the tungsten replicator directory, support filters config, and there is a file here called convert string from mysql.json. We need to copy that file into a directory called opt continuant share. Okay, uh, you will need to pre create the share directory, so create that drop and copy that file in. Um, once that's in, uh, we can then go back to our software install base. Um, we can then get the rest of the configuration ready. So um, my install here is done via um, an INI config file. So let's look at this INI config. Um, a lot of parameters here, a lot of things uh, you should be familiar with from the cluster. So I'm just gonna step through a few of the specific ones uh, that we need. So first of all, in defaults, we have this these two lines here. This is enabling the filter called convert string from MySQL. And that file that we've just copied, uh, that's the location we've put it in. OK, um, this is to enable us to process and um, replicate the data that is coming out of a MySQL cluster because of the way that the THL and everything operates within the cluster. If we don't have this, then the, the data won't be in a, in a readable format that we can replicate. So this just enables the filter to do the work that we need to do. It's basically the applier's version of the enable heterogeneous service that we put in the cluster. This is the bit that we put on this side to, to do the, the rest of that work. We also need to set up a cluster alias. Uh, important thing here is the name has to be exactly the same name as your cluster service. So my cluster is NYC, so I have NYC here. Um, I tell it it's a cluster alias and I specify the master and the members. Okay, it's very important that that name is the same. We then set up the two replication services, the applier services. So I have a REPL to Redshift and REPL to Kafka, and then all of the relevant parameters for that. So data source type is fairly obvious. I'm telling it it's Redshift. Um, I'm telling it it's a cluster slave, so that 
enables it to know that it's coming, uh, that the source THL is out of a cluster, that it's THL that already exists. Um, the relay CSO1, that is the host that I'm on. That's my cluster slave host right now that we're installing on. My relay source is NYC, which links to my cluster alias. So it knows that we're pulling from this cluster. Credentials for Redshift, um, enabling batch enable, uh, applier. Um, I'm applying the replicate and the drop statement data filter. Drop statement data is to remove DDL. Uh, we don't replicate DDL to heterogeneous environments yet. That is in development and hopefully we'll soon have um, some releases that will enable a DDL translation. Uh, we also need to uh, enable the replicate filter in my case because I only want to replicate a certain schema. I'm not replicating my entire database. So this enables that um we are putting the thl port on a different uh, port number and the rmi port on a different number that's important because we have two applier services so we need to make sure they don't clash so my redshift for example 2114 my kafka 2116 um the database in redshift i'm replicating into uh, the actual endpoint of my redshift cluster and then the the detail for the replicate filter so i'm saying do hr so this will only replicate changes for anything within the hr schema um, that can be a comma separated list of schemas um, and it can also be tables so if it would be a schema dot table name format um, so if you want to filter to only replicate those, it will do only those and nothing else. You could also do the replicate dot ignore. So I could say dot ignore HR and it will give me everything except HR. So it's just the relevant switches that you need there. The final two, I, I know I'm jumping around a bit here, not in order, but the final two, apply a block commit interval and apply a block commit size. This is a performance tuning parameters. So this is basically saying um, once we have the CSV files, how often do we actually run the javascript process to load them up and we can either do it in blocks um, so every five blocks or every 10 seconds whichever comes first okay and then we have the kafka settings pretty much exactly the same we have the properties which are telling the applier where zookeeper is and the port that zookeeper is on the property for the port that um, Zuki, uh, sorry, that Kafka is running on. And here I also have the replicate filter. I'm saying only the zoo. So in my source cluster, I have two schemas, one called HR, one called zoo, and I'm sending HR to Redshift and I'm sending zoo to Kafka. It's just showing you that fan out style deployment that we can do and the, the way that we can filter it. So that's basically the, the configuration. But before we actually do the install, we have a couple of more a couple more steps to do specifically for the Redshift side of things. So first of all, in the home directory of your host, you need to create a file called .s3 cfg and in there you need to place your access key for aws and your aws secret key i won't show you this file because it's got my personal credentials in and i don't want to broadcast them on this webinar uh, but i have a sample file here which i will show you uh so you can for example and that's the format that the file looks like so the default block access key and your access key secret key and your secret key um, one final file we need to create is in the opt continuance share directory. Here you can see we already have the convert string from my SQL file that I copied in at the start. We then also need to create a file called s3 config and then the service name of your Redshift applier. Dot JSON. Again, this has credentials in, so I'm not going to show you this actual file, but I'll show you this example file so you can see the format of it. And it's basically just a piece of JSON, uh, AWS S3 path, where we're, this, this is the, uh, the directory, the, the point in S3 that we're going to write out to, uh, your access and your secret key again. And then this property called cleanup S3 files, I've set it to true. What this means is once we have processed the CSV file on S3, we will delete it. Um, if you want to keep those CSV files forever, just change that parameter to false and we won't delete them. Uh, that can be handy if you want um, a full history of change um, that's happened. Um, it can also be useful if you have problems and need to reprovision certain bits of data. There's, there's options there. There are other parameters as well that you can put in this JSON, but these are the minimum. Um, if you look at the documentation, they're all explained in more detail. 
OK, so once we've got all of that information in place, we can then go to opt continuant software and the path and we can do the installation. So you would typically do tools slash TPM validate that will run a cursory check on the INI file and make sure it can actually reach out to all the hosts that you have specified, the source cluster and your target Kafka and your target Redshift, and it will print out any warnings, etc. cetera, there's any problems it finds. Resolve those warnings. Once you're happy, you can do tools TPM install. Now, obviously, as I've mentioned, I've already done that, so I don't, uh, I don't want to run it anymore. Once it's installed and before you start with Redshift, um, obviously you need to pre-create the table. So you need to get your schema in place. Now, what we do have is a tool called DDL scan. So I'm just going to jump back to my cluster hosts. DDL scan is obviously installed already on here. So I'm just going to run uh, through this and show you what we do. So we have a command, oops, DDL scan, uh, the DB that we are wanting to uh, replicate from MySQL to Redshift in this case is HR. And I want to say use the template DDL MySQL Redshift staging VM. I've only got one table in the HR table, so I'm just going to run this as it is. If you have hundreds of tables, you can just output the results of this into a file, uh, t.sql, for example, and then review it later. But what that will basically do is it will reverse engineer um, anything in the HR schema, and it will give you the, the relevant um, uh, DDL to create that table in Redshift. So I've used the staging template first. So it has created my stage tables, stage underscore XXX underscore, then your table name. This is the table that the CSV file data gets loaded into. Um, and as you can see, we've automatically um, prefixed four columns, opcode, sequence number, row ID, commit timestamp. Opcode, this is the I or the D for inserts or deletes. The sequence number is associated with the THL. And then the row ID would be the associated row of data within that seek node. So if there was five transactions or five statements in a sequence, because it was a, in a transaction block, each one would have a unique row ID in here. And then the commit timestamp, the, the, the time that we got it. And then all of your columns with the relevant conversions of whatever the column was in MySQL converted to the equivalent in Redshift. If there are any columns that we don't can't convert or haven't got a conversion for, the comment here will have a warning um, and you will uh, you will then be able to edit it and change the, the data type to suit um, according to your needs. Once you have this information, you can copy the create table. You don't need to copy, copy the drop table if you don't want because it doesn't exist. Um, make sure you do the create schema in Redshift and then run your create table. Once you've done that, you then need to do the same again, but take the word dash staging off and use the normal uh, template. This will do exactly the same thing, but as you can see, this is just the table name, employees, rather than the stage table name, and it doesn't have the, uh, the additional columns. So once you've done that, also copy that and run that into Redshift. So what that will actually do is um, pre-create all of your table structure in Redshift, and then we can start replication. I'm just going to jump back to here. If I just go into uh, into my Redshift environment, okay. So I'm logging in uh, using PSQL, my username, and the host and the port number and the database I've created called Demo. And if I just do a describe here on HR dot employees, um, we can see. Uh, no, it's I'm in. Um, I forgot I'm not in uh, MySQL now, I'm in Redshift, which is effectively uh, Postgres, uh, Postgres commands. So I do describe on the table, and this is the table that I created, the HR employees table. I could do the same again with the stage underscore XXX underscore, and we can see that that table data is there as well. So once you've got that created, you can then start the replicator. And that's simply a case of running replicator start. In my case, I believe my replicator is already running, so I don't need to start it. But yeah, you just issue start. That will start the replicator. And then hopefully all being well, 
you can run a T-Rep CTL services and we should see that we have um, our REPL to Kafka service and it's online and we have our REPL to Redshift service and that's online. So this is the summary. If we want to then look at these in detail, you can run T-Rep CTL service and tell it which service you want to look at. So REPL to Kafka and then status. And then we can see the more, uh, the deeper kind of level of parameters that you, you get from your T-Rep CTL status. You should be familiar with a lot of this if you're already a clustering user. Um, it's very similar. Um, because we're a cluster slave, uh, we do um, have all of the nodes in the cluster as our master connect URI. And what this means is that um, if the, the node that we're currently pulling THL from, in the case here, my pipeline source is DB2. So if DB2 went away for any reason, it would round robin uh, through this list to find the next available host to pull. So this is uh, the great uh, benefit of doing a cluster slave. You don't, uh, you're not tied to a specific host. So a host goes down, your replication is still going to continue. Um, we by default don't pull from the master. That's actually a property that's set in the replicator. You can disable that property. So if you don't mind pulling THR from the master, you can you can do that uh, by default. It's disabled. So we only go for a slave. And that's it. Um, we can look at the same thing for, for Redshift. And we can see that uh, everything is running there as well. And we can see where it's coming from and all the endpoints and, and the, the settings. So um, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you is just go through that in a little bit more detail. I didn't have time to do that on the main webinar. So I hope you found that useful. Um, and as as we always say, you know, if you have any questions or any concerns, or if you want to try this out in your own environment, then please do get in touch. Our contact details are on the screen. If you're an existing customer, you should um, already have uh, the, the various paths to contact us. So please, please do reach out. We'd love to hear from you and uh, we hope to speak to you soon. Thank you and goodbye.